Well, if you've picked up a leaflet when you came in this morning, you'll see that on the cover I've put uh, a photograph of David Suchet. Uh, some of you might be familiar with him. He was uh, uh, very popular for his role in Agatha Christie's uh, Belgian detective series Poirot, uh, in which he really made his name. When he, when he came to Melbourne a year or two ago, uh, it was all the Poirot fans that turned up to hear him. Uh, less well known, perhaps, uh, is the rest of his story, and I'm going to refer to that a little bit later, and I'm hoping you'll see why his image uh, suits uh, our passage today, even though that I might uh, be explaining that shortly. So I've called... Uh, I was in two minds... Uh, in, the, in the notes, I've called what I'm going to say five surprising things. All right. So Christine's read a passage, and you might say, what's the theme in the passage? And, and I almost passed over it, but then I thought, no, it's here for a reason. Let's try and find out what this passage says. And I found five surprising things, and, and I want to share them with you. Uh, so first of all, I want to talk to you about the epic journey, right? and we've already mentioned that. Then I want to talk about the enduring letters, the forgotten team. That's really the, the reason I asked Christine to do the reading, so that she would have plenty of time to just have a look at the names. I don't think she had any trouble at all with the names. But sometimes, and this is harking back to the days when boys used to read the Bible in assembly at school, uh, they like to know well ahead of time if there were any hard words in the reading. And the names are not uh, common names today. So we, we, we went over the names. And then there's the amazing collection. What collection? Well, that's a good question. We'll come to that. And then finally, the living church. So five things to think about. And I'm uh, hoping that we'll, we'll find something in probably each of these categories as we think about this passage this morning. So before we go any further, let me just pray that God will use these, these ideas from this passage of Scripture. Lord, we pray that as we explore the text, we might discover uh, hidden treasure, treasure like the Lord spoke of in the field, something worth gathering to ourselves as we journey in our lives into a new week, into the post-lockdown era, into living with COVID, into this stage of our own particular journey. Journey with us, we pray, for Jesus' sake. Amen. All right, so first of all, the epic journey. Now, which of you can actually say where the journey was in the story? Where, what was the travelling? Did you pick it up? It's very easy once you get a few countries named or a few places that you're not really familiar with to think, where, well, did it really matter? I don't know those places. And, and, and the names and so on. So I've gone back to a map and I thought I'd just pencil in on the map the route Paul takes. Okay, so I've, I've marked it there. Where did Paul travel from? Well, we begin in Ephesus. Need I remind you that we're in the Roman Empire? A few years back we went to uh, the, the Australian Museum in Canberra to an exhibition of Rome, city and empire. It was a great exhibition. And we're starting in Ephesus. That's where the, rest, where the reading was last time. And this is Diana of the Ephesians. This is the little plastic model that I got sent by my, my archaeologist friend. I had it with me last week, but it was left in my bag. So uh, the, uh, the original statue was over two metres high. The silversmiths in Ephesus made silver models of this, sold it to the tourists who came. The story went back hundreds of years about Diana, or Artemis as they called her in Greek. And so great was Artemis of Ephesus. And the Romans didn't mind so much about that as long as Augustus got his place and the image of, of Augustus, and I'm sure you've seen them in in magazines, in, uh, in books and so on, of the imperial Augustus with his finger pointing forward, uh, very strong features, a man who brought peace, 
who brought, uh, the, was the saviour of the, the world, the Romans said, that, that image had to be supported in the pantheon of the gods. So the empire and the city of Rome was where it all happened. And uh, the local deity that was worshipped, and widely worshipped because Ephesus was a big and powerful city, was Artemis or Diana as she was known to the Romans. So Paul is there. And there's been an uproar that took him to the theatre. And I, I put on the screen an image of the theatre last week because we were privileged to visit Ephesus a few years ago. But when Paul left Ephesus, he, uh, he went up the coast and he crossed over to the port of Neapolis and, uh, and to Philippi and Thessalonica. And I'm going to suggest, you see, I took that line right across, I hope you saw that, to the, the, the uh, west coast of Greece. That is to, from the, from the uh, Aegean Sea right across to the Adriatic Sea. That's the Via Ignatia, the main road. Uh, that they traveled on that route. And I've put that there because, well, I'll tell you why later, but then after that he went down and came down to Corinth. Now this is his journey. This is the route he followed. I want you to remember, however, that we, we're here in, in, uh, in the story that fits in with this passage, we hear of Titus. His name wasn't mentioned, uh, but there was a, a letter taken from Ephesus across to Corinth while Paul is making this trip. We're talking about a trip that takes a year or more. So it's a, it's a long time. Paul's been in Ephesus for close to three years. Remember he hired the lecture hall of Tyrannus. He taught there. And eventually the culture must have begun to change uh, as, as people realized en masse uh, that he was changing their ways. Uh, and it was coming from this little man preaching his message. So in the, in the compact space of a few verses, we're told that Paul revisited Philippi, Thessalonica, Berea, possibly going as far west as Illyricum uh, on the Adriatic coast. That's mentioned in Romans chapter 15. He says he went as far as Illyricum, uh, which was a Roman province on that, that end of the Ignatian Way before you had to get the boat across to Brindisi. So that, that was uh, the suggestion that Paul went that way. Now, it just so happens, of course, that the Bible is full of journeyings. It's not hard to, to find them, is it? As soon as you think about the story of the Bible, from Abraham on, you've got somebody on a journey. From Ur of the Chaldees to Haran to Canaan, Canaan, the promised land, to Egypt and back to Canaan with his fingers wrapped because of what happened in, Cana in, in Egypt. You've got the story of Joseph and Joseph's family. You've got the Exodus story, great story of the Old Testament, the, re the visual aid, as it were, of redemption. But it wasn't only the uh, biblical narrative that told the story. There was a story told by Virgil, uh, now, I have to say that I didn't know this story, but I've, and I've never read Homer, uh, but, but Homer is a story of, uh, of a travel, you know, the story of the Greek wars, the Trojan horse coming away from that. And the place that that story is set is Troy, which is up here. The Grecian wars happened at Troy. And the, the city of Troy is thousands of years old, and the region is we're traveling through is called Troas and the main city there is Troy. So what do we know about that story in the culture of the empire? Well it's interesting because Virgil's story is told in a poem. I've never read the poem. I've, uh, it's 18,000 lines of poetry so it's a long epic poem and it tells the story how from the ashes of the Greek Empire, the city of Rome was established to rule the world. And it was a poem written for Augustus. And Virgil knew Augustus and he told the story there. And it got the imprimatur. It was the gospel of Rome, if you like. This is how the good news came to the world through Augustus. By the defeat at the Battle of Actium of the enemies of the Republic. And, and so 
Augustus restored the Republic, he said, but he really set up just a new empire. And, and he was to be lauded as, as a god. And his successors called themselves sons of God, son of a god. So that was the background. And suddenly when you think of that, and you think about how Luke has presented volume one, Luke's gospel, about a saviour who's come to bring peace, who has brought good news to the world, you see that Luke is setting up a counter story. It's a different story, a different kind of saviour altogether. And we need to be aware of that background story of Virgil. Uh, it's called the, I never know how to pronounce a word that begins with an A-E, the Aeneid, uh, and the hero of it is Aeneas. And he's the one who leads the founding of the city of Rome. So that was the story, and it's a story told in two parts, just as Luke has told his story in two parts. Except Luke's story has an anti-hero, for, for Paul himself is not the hero of the story. The hero of the story is Jesus, who is at the crux of the story, and crux meaning cross. So there's the, the first thing is the journey. The journey as a picture of our lives, the journey in which God is, uh, is part of, becomes part of our story. But while we're thinking about these things, there is something else. I've called them the enduring letters. Now, it seems likely that Paul wrote uh, to the Corinthians and to the Romans while he was on this journey. He was journeying west through Macedonia. Let me read to you a little bit from Romans chapter 15 so you get a feel for this. So this is the, close to the end of the letter to the Romans. Now, we, if, you, if you were listening a couple of weeks ago, what Paul said he, he hoped to go to Rome at some point. So he had Rome as his focus even though he's at Troy. So, so he says, and so I have been, this is Romans chapter 15 from verse 22. I've been prevented many times from coming to you, but now that I have finished my work in these regions, since I've been wanting for so many years to come to you, I hope to do so now. I would like to see you on my way to Spain and be helped by you to go there after I've enjoyed visiting you for a while. Just now, however... I'm going to Jerusalem in the service of God's people there. For the churches in Macedonia, right, that's the area across the top of Greece, and Achaia, that's the southwest of Turkey, uh, the, people of the churches in Macedonia and Achaia have freely decided to give an offering. Now that's not mentioned in the reading. There's nothing about that, but here it's mentioned. To give an offering to help the poor among God's people in Jerusalem. That decision was their own, but as a matter of fact, they have an obligation since the Jews shared their spiritual blessings with the Gentiles. The Gentiles ought to share their material blessings to help the Jews. When I've finished this task and have handed over to them all the money that has been raised for them, I shall leave for Spain and visit you on my way there. When I come to you, I know that I shall come with the full blessing and measure of Christ. So here is Paul. And he's writing to the Romans, and at the end of his letter, he tells them about his intention to visit on his way to Spain, something which he had mentioned in chapter 18 of the, Luke mentions in chapter 18 of the Acts of the Apostles. So here is the letters. And, and it's a little bit uh, tricky because we, we read the Corinthian letters, and, and a lot has been happening in Corinth. I want to say... For a start, if you read 1 Corinthians carefully, when you get to chapter 5, verse 9, you'll find the apostle says, in my earlier letter. So 1 Corinthians wasn't the first letter. You with me? There was a, 1 Corinthians refer, refers to an earlier letter. So how many times did Paul write to the Corinthians? Well, most scholars would say there were four letters to the Corinthians. In 1 Corinthians chapter 7, he talks about your letter. So the Corinthians had written to him. They had wanted to know about certain things. And when he replied in 1 Corinthians, after getting to the, doing, 
saying what he had heard about them in the first six chapters, he comes to chapter 7 and said, now about the things you, you wrote to me about. And he talks about them. So, so that's in 1 Corinthians. And then if you come to 2 Corinthians, you'll find in chapter uh, 2, there's a letter of tears. It's called a painful letter sometimes, or the letter of tears. What was that about? It seems there was a letter to them that, he, that grieved him. It reduced him to tears as he wrote to them. And we get that in 2 Corinthians. And there's somebody in the church at Corinth who's so immoral that it's bringing the name of Christ into disrepute. And he says that shouldn't be. And he, he refers to that. And that's, that letter uh, was carried, as far as we can tell, by Titus. Uh, because in 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 5 through 12, Titus comes back with a message from the Corinthians. Now, that's, I know that's a little bit technical, but if you're reading First and Second Corinthians, you'll find that they are, have these references. And, and indeed, in 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and 9, we have two chapters which deal about the offering, the collection that Paul is making for the saints in Jerusalem. They contain verses that are uh, memorable. Uh, one of the great ones, of course, is you know the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, so that you, through his poverty, you and me through his poverty might be enriched. And so he, he speaks to them and he gives them reasons, and that's one of the reasons that they should be generous. Christians should be generous people. And so he's, he's putting this on the churches that have experienced blessing, but he's distressed by some of the things that are going on. And Corinth was a difficult situation. Mostly he went to the synagogue and he ministered there until he got moved on. And sometimes that was quite quick. But then remember at Corinth, he stayed there 18 months. God had many people in that city. And it was a city with two ports. And so it was a city which was dynamic and multicultural and mobile with all the problems that that brought. And so he had to deal with a much more complex situation in the Corinthian correspondence. And what we have uh, is uh, two of the letters. Some scholars believe that 2 Corinthians includes the uh, third and fourth letters. So be that as it may, we have the text that we have here. And the, the final thing is the letter to the Romans. Uh, he, he was traveling through uh, uh, this part of the world, but he, he's, uh, and he's encouraging the churches that he's established in Philippi, in Thessalonica, in Berea, and, and then down in Corinth. But he's also doing it by his writing. He's writing to them, and he writes a full statement of the letter to the Romans, which Priscilla and Aquila would have taken back to Rome. So... So this is the correspondence that's going on. And, and I say to you, why, why is this so significant? Well, we think of our Bibles, but we often don't think of the, the situation under which the text is, has been written and come to us. And, uh, but I've called it the enduring letters. Right? What was enduring about them? Well, let me just give you one example. In 1986, David Suchet was in a hotel room in New York. And he read Romans 8, and it changed his life. He has Jewish parentage on his father's side and on his mother's side. There's a stream of, Jude uh, of Jewish background in both sides of his family. But he was raised an atheist. There was no religion in his family. But when he read Romans 8, it changed him, and he became a believer. And some of you might have watched, as Christine and I did, uh, a series that he did on uh, in the steps of St. Paul. It's a series worth watching because he actually follows these journeys that we're on. He gets down onto the Roman roads and he walks them. And he meets people and he sees archaeological situations. And he's, as an actor, he's trying to get into the mind of the apostle. And he does it remarkably well. He makes notes from his New Testament and the kind of things that Paul said and what sort of temperament he might have had. And he's trying to reimagine what that was like. So 
David Suchet, uh, today of course, is, he, I, I discovered to my surprise that he's been knighted. Uh, in, 19, in 2020 he was, became Sir David Suchet. And, and he's also, to, now, nowadays he's also a vice president of the, the British Bible Society uh, and an advocate for the Bible. And those of you who, who are familiar with the Bible in One Year, for example, which comes out of Nicky Gumbel's church in London, will be, for, be aware that David Suchet reads the entire Bible and you can hear his voice reading the Bible to you day by day by day, the whole Bible in one year. And I don't, apart from Amanda, I don't know anybody who reads the Bible that well. Uh, he's just got a, a gift for it. So I, I, so I put David Suchet on the cover because although the letter to the Romans isn't mentioned here, Rome is where he's going. And he wants to write to them, and he's never been there, so he explains the gospel fully in 16 chapters. And uh, it's a theological statement that changed Martin Luther, and it changed people, changed David Suchet, and it changed you and me as we read it and think about it. So then let's just go one step further. Let's, uh, uh, I've just mentioned David Suchet here. I've, uh, I should have maybe put these images on the screen while I was talking. He read Romans 8 and back in 1986. And uh, he's, he, he stands before us as a, as a modern example of a contemporary uh, human being who's been touched by an ancient letter whose message has endured over the many years. But now get, let's go to the forgotten team because there's a list of names here. And most of us wouldn't have a clue about about them and we'll probably forget them after today once again. Um, so we've got Sopater, Sopater. He's from Berea. That's where the, Christ, the, uh, the first believers received the message without argument. They, they found it convincing. There's Aristarchus from Thessalonica. There's Secundus. I always feel sorry for somebody whose name means number two. You know, <laughs> Number two. Uh, Secundus from Thessalonica as well and Gaius from Derby. Remember on his first missionary trip, he went just into central Turkey, and on his uh, second missionary trip, he came through central uh, Turkey, down, uh, wanted to go to Ephesus, but couldn't. He went on up to the north and uh, was kept from going to Ephesus on that trip until briefly at the end. And then on his third trip, he got to Ephesus. Tychius, Tychia, Tychicus was from Ephesus as well. Trophimus was from Ephesus, and Timothy was from Lystra. So here are seven people representing a number of the churches that he had been to and from whom he had received gifts to take to the Christians, the believing Jews in Jerusalem. Now, I think if you're traveling with a sum of money, it's wise to have a reasonably large party with you uh, because we know from the story of the Good Samaritan uh, that it's possible to get jumped on roads even in Jerusalem, never mind in far reaches of the empire. But also, it, good practice for accounting. And the churches have uh, always sought to have wisdom in the, uh, the uh, management of the money of the church. And we have a board meeting this week. And the money that's contributed to the church needs to be accounted for. And we give uh, statements each year. Uh, we haven't had an annual general meeting for a long time, but that accountability will come to you in the coming months. Uh, and it will be beginning as the board looks at the statements for the last uh, week. When Paul was alone, he didn't like it. He was in Athens, remember, waiting for the others, and he didn't like being alone. He liked to work as part of a team. He liked to have companions. And from what we read, he hardly ever traveled, traveled alone. But here we have uh, these uh, people traveling with him and carrying with them the collection, the enduring the amazing collection, I called it. Charitable activity wasn't unknown in the ancient world. For example, I put this on the screen last week. This was about a fountain uh, with this Latin name, but it was a fountain uh, donated uh, by Tiberius Claudius Aristion and his wife between AD 102 and 114 in the city of Ephesus. And here is Artemis of Ephesus. Now, this was a fountain that these people dedicated. They, they donated to the, the city. 
So they're you know, charitable acts. But they did have their name written on it in the city of Ephesus. Now what happened with, with, the, uh, with these men? Well, Luke, in, in the gospel, in, in the Acts of the Apostles, doesn't mention the collection at all. He doesn't say they were traveling with so many dollars and so many cents or so many drachma or whatever the currency was. So he, it, it's not, it's not uh, being played up. Remember Jesus said that when you give, don't let your uh, left hand know what your right hand is doing. You know, you, there's a sense in which our, our gifts for the work of God are between us and God. Um, and so and, and it's not there for us to parade our, ge- our generosity. And Luke doesn't mention the collection, though he mentions the men who are traveling with the Apostle Paul. So we know about the collection, as I've already suggested, from the Corinthian correspondence and from the letter to the Romans. They both mention it. And this was when they were written. Now, the living church. What do I mean by this? Well... It's, it's interesting, uh, this is in Troy, at Troas. Uh, the church is meeting on an upper room, third floor. The apostle is talking and presumably there's a lot of dialogue. It's not just a, I like to think it's not just an unending sermon uh, where everybody nods off and, and uh, eventually he, he's wakened up because somebody falls out of the window. Uh, I think there's dialogue going on. Uh, Eutychus was very likely a slave. There were many slaves in the early church. The church appealed to women and to slaves because of the the recognition that it gave to them as people in the image of God. And so uh, he'd possibly been working all day. We know it was Sunday, the first day of the week, we're told. So on the first day of the week, the church met, the day of resurrection, and they're hearing the news about Jesus who had died, what, 20 years before? So this is early in the church's story. The church doesn't have buildings, it's people. It's people gathering in in a home, presumably the home of one of the wealthy believers. And it's smoky. They don't have fluorescent lighting. They've got oil lamps. I've got a little oil lamp. I've shown it to you before. When you light it, it gives off black smoke. It's pretty messy. And if you can imagine a room becoming more and more filled with particles of smoke, then you've got the idea. And it's, you've been tired. Do you know that feeling of you just can't keep your head up any longer? It's just so, so, I've, I can sleep in lots of places. I possibly could sleep standing up, you know. But when you feel that really tiredness, when you're in a room that's getting warmer, maybe I'll just turn the heating off now. But, uh, so, so that's the situation that Eutychus is in. And he falls. And Luke says he's dead. Luke has joined the party by this time, the group of the seven. And Luke is with them now. Uh, so there's eight. And they're journeying to Jerusalem. Originally he had hoped to get to Jerusalem for, uh, for Passover. That was in Corinth. But he heard there was a plot to kill him. Some of the Jews were going to get rid of him. And if he'd sailed from Corinth on, with a boatload of Jewish pilgrims heading to Jerusalem for Passover, it's not hard, Sir William Ramsey says, to imagine that some of them could have been incited to, to get rid of Paul because he was causing havoc in synagogues around the area, to throw him overboard. What, who, would, who would know what happened? So Paul, rather than going across to, to Jerusalem for Passover goes all the way back around he came that they came by land and now they're sailing down they're crossing the coast and going to sail down uh, and they're hoping to be there for Pentecost 50 days after Passover so the whole trip has been set back by that plot so here they are and there's a community there and and the, the the fact that this young man has been named reminds us that God's church is made up of people it's made up of uh, men and women, individuals, and, and they have names. Even if their name is Segundus, you know, number two. Uh, God knows us. There's a beautiful uh, song by Leonard Cohen called, uh, not Leonard Cohen, Bob Dylan. Uh, Ev- every hair is numbered like every grain of sand. I think it's called every grain of sand. The idea that God knows us. 
our, our fingerprint. It's not just you know, Apple or our smart device that knows our fingerprint. God knows your fingerprint. God knows your DNA. God knows everything about us. And so uh, David Suchet uh, was somebody who was brought into the church of God through reading Paul's letter to the Romans. Eutychus in the gathered church and Sunday fellowship, they're celebrating Holy Communion. We could learn about some of the things we should, be do, we should and do do uh, from this inter- story here. I think probably we will light on interactive discussion. There's too much talking by me. But one week in Troy, uh, the Master is present. And just as Jesus healed people and even raised the dead, that blessing comes through uh, Paul as well. It's as if Christ is present with them. But the other side of it is this great story, the great narrative. And, and, and this is what I did. I, I looked up Virgil online, as you can, and I looked up Google Books and found a copy of Virgil. And this is the front page of Virgil's Aeneas, told by somebody called uh, Bishop, uh, the Bishop of Dunkeld in Scotland. And he's translated the Latin into broad Scots in 1710. You know how long ago that was? That's a long time ago. So that there were Scots who were reading this story 300 years ago. So 1890, yes, 300 years ago. So what is this saying to us? I think it's saying to us that uh, Virgil's epic story of empire from Troy to Rome is upstaged by the way of Jesus and his church. So that when you go to see Rome, city and empire, you see the vestiges of something that was magnificent and amazing and awesome, but it was based on slavery and it was based on military power. And the empires of this world tend to be like that. But the kingdom of our God and of his Christ is different. Because whereas, as uh, I I said uh, previously, uh, the true God gives his flesh and blood. That's the communion that they shared in the upper room in Troas, in Troy. But uh, the true God gives his flesh and blood, but the idols demand yours off you. And so I think Paul walked across in that last section Before they began their trip down the Turkish coasts on the route back to Jerusalem, Paul took time to walk across the peninsula. It says, Luke tells us, uh, that he walked the first lap while the boat sailed around the peninsula. He walked across. And I like to think that he took his time that morning to check that Eutychus was fine and he began to think about the journey from Troy to Rome that he was making. Perhaps he knew Virgil. I don't know. We don't know. There's nothing in Luke's act writings to suggest he knew it either. But it's an astonishing story that there is a kingdom in the world today that invites our loyalty and allegiance. And it's not the way of empire or nationalism. It's, a, it's about our God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Now I'm going to lead in prayer. I'm trying to tie in some of the things that this passage of scripture makes us think about and I'd like to lead, lead in prayer before we say the Lord's Prayer together. So shall we pray? Lord Jesus Christ, as we bow before you now, we give thanks that through your servant Paul, you brought healing to Eutychus and joy to the believers in a smoky room in Troas. Thank you that while the great redemptive story is your project, you notice the sparrow that falls, the hairs of her head are numbered like every grain of sand. Thank you that the gospel tells of in your earthly sojourn your purpose was to heal and to save and to restore and renew. Thank you that this message has reached to each of us as we have journeyed in life. We have heard your call our name, drawing us with the cords of love. Thank you that the message of Jesus traveled from Troy to Rome, 
with hope transcending any that this world's empires can offer and that the gates of hell will not prevail against it. We remember those dark places in our world today, wherever the safety, dignity, health and hope of people is attacked or suppressed. We ask you to usher in justice and righteousness, strengthen your people to witness to what is true. We think dark threads in our, of dark threads in our own national history, and we ask that respect, reconciliation and righteousness will prevail. Help us to care for the vulnerable and provide purpose to the rising generation. Thank you for the work of African Enterprise in their ministry to F. W. D. Clerk, who passed away this week. We think too of places where lives are devalued and people oppressed by cruelty, violence or poverty. Bangladesh as a country is before us today, where Christian believers are under social and civic pressures especially given the million Myanmar refugees in the country, help these and neighboring, and neighboring countries by providing leaders who seek peace and pursue it earnestly with their neighbors. Provide for the thousands of res refugees locked on the Belarus, Polish, and many more locations around the world as they flee war. Thank you that the ministry of Jesus became the inspiration for so much healing and medical research and that we have been the recipients of such care and blessing. Guide our leaders as they navigate the issues relating to COVID-19 in the months ahead. Guide them too as they seek policies that harness renewable energy and decrease pollution and waste. Help us as we weigh up our own practices with respect to purchasing, packaging, and recycling. Thank you that the scriptures contain letters penned to people in real life situations of challenge and difficulty so that we with the challenges of our age might through what is written have guidance, wisdom and a sure hope for the future. We're not particularly good at being team players or about working together across innate cultural or self-made denominational boundaries. Please forgive us the disunity that reminds us that your church is broken. It is indeed a hospital for sinners. Lead us, Holy Spirit, to be unafraid of interdependence and to play our part as contributors to the dynamism and health of your church. Help us in our relationships with one another to avoid pretense and to enjoy goodwill and honest communication that will demonstrate your reign in our lives. We commit to you our elderly, frail and troubled friends this morning. We think especially of Will who has had a fall this week, of Nola who's had a string of health concerns, Manfred, Hillary, Ogilvy, and we thank you that we're able here to take time to pray for them in the quietness now. As we lift them to you, Heavenly Father, may they know the Lord Jesus present with them. And uh, he has encouraged us to pray together, saying, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Our closing hymn is number 512. Take my life and let it be consecrated, Lord, to thee.